uh, oh, the second Opium War. Here we are. So now we're fighting with, um, fuck you, Denmark. So now we're fighting with China. Why are we fighting with China? Well, the Heavenly Kingdom is around. Why is this changing things? Fuck you, Prussia. Why is this changing things? It was basically, the Heavenly Kingdom was this revolt of uh, sort of Christian uh, and sort of millenarian uh, rebels. And uh, what does this mean is that they wanted to create essentially a utopia on Earth through religion, through a mass apocalypse, which sounds worse than it is in practice, but in practice it wasn't the greatest thing ever. Uh, so they also um, revolted against the Qing because they were, uh, the Qing are Manchus. Now if you take a look at the Chinese culture over here, there's North Han and Manchu. Manchu is what's around here, essentially. It's this thing, or used to be, they're not there anymore. Because Han, when the Manchus conquered the Han, who are what we call Chinese, or the Han, as it would be best pronounced in uh, Mandarin, they just basically unified the what they called the Jurchen realms, which were a bunch of tribal, you know, tribal countries, not really the correct term, but whatever, uh, with China. And uh, they imposed, like, they emigrated to China, partially because they became kind of a ruling class. Uh, however, it also happened a kind of reverse movement. So basically, this whole Qing Empire was just, you know, a sort of ethnic... Um, ethnic realm where the Manchus were first-class citizens and despite all the propaganda of it being like a harmonious united blah 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 um, between Manchu and Han it really was just the Manchus running a show for a long time long time now the Henley Kingdom in real life wasn't nearly as wimpy as it is in Victoria too um, and uh, since it created a whole bunch of problems at one point uh, the Western people that were trading with China at the time went to China and were like, okay, so you need the Heavenly Kingdom dealt with, and we need to trade in the area where the Heavenly Kingdom is, and if there's a war, we can't do that. So we're gonna go in and help you kill the Heavenly Kingdom. But at the same time, the Chinese weren't really, um... oh wow, they occupied Hong Kong, that's hilarious. They weren't really uh, sort of abiding by what the first uh, Treaty of Nanjing not the first one, the, the Treaty of Nanjing, after the first Opium War, had dictated that a bunch of ports be opened up to trade and, uh, you know, that Westerners could just travel in China freely. They weren't really allowing that. Why the fuck are the Prussians invade, and the Danish invading Taiwan? I don't know. Victoria, too. Um, and because they weren't allowing that, while the Frenchies and especially the British were helping the Qing Empire to put down their rebels. Oh, it looks like we're at War of Persia. Um, to put down the rebels, they sailed a fleet all the way up to this place, which is called the Peiho. Or, see, this is kind of a weird thing. I have no idea what it's actually called in Chinese. If it's Baiho or Beiho, uh, or He, um, which just is a river. It's the river that leads to Beijing. They just sailed it up. There's over here. There's like a, a bunch of fortifications called the Dagu Forts that were protecting the river from ships coming into the sea, into the river, to sail up and bombard the capital or wherever. So they came up and, uh, you know, a few times they just, you know, exchanged fire, killed a bunch of people, occupied the forts or whatever. And uh, what resulted in that was the second Opium War, or Arrow War, after the ship that was essentially the whole Casas Valley. It was one of those weird accidents, you know. It's like, wow, why you attack this ship? Uh, this is the, totally the reason we're going to war and not, you know, more complex things. Uh, Jesus Christ, apparently we have to bear a lot of expenses. And uh, our artisans are going bankrupt. I wonder which artisans are going bankrupt. I don't know. And uh, so they went up there. They didn't invade Manchuria, fortify some people. They just kind of rolled up in there with ships bombed a bunch of things. Then they landed an army, they went all the way up to Beijing. When the Chinese proved to be uncooperative, they went in there, they occupied uh, the outskirts of Beijing, 
But what was in the outskirts of Beijing? It was the uh, summer palace, which was the summer residences of the Chinese emperors, which was actually like entirely sort of uh, built or uh, designed by like Western architects. And it was designed to be sort of a replica. And this is the event. So once the British occupy Beijing, there's this event that was designed as kind of a replica of like what the Western palace fashion was like in the 17th century or whatever. I, I'm not 100% sure as to what that would have looked like, but it would have, it would have been a weird sort of architectural fusion and, you know, sort of a patrimony of humanity or whatever. And um, the commander, who I believe was called something like Lord Elgin, I believe, something like that, I was like, oh shit, that's not a really good idea. But then like the Chinese double crossed them a bunch of times in dealings, and so he was like fucking angry. And it's like, oh, I'm just there's either two things that I can do to sort of, uh, you know, sort of make the Chinese pay for what they've done to us or whatever. Um, one, I can torch their palace, or two, I can torch their city. And since he didn't want a bunch of people to die, he torched the palace, or at least that's the reasoning that he gives in his memoirs. Uh, which I didn't read myself, but I... <laughs> That's a funny Persia. And uh, now we're at war with them. Uh, but they were... They're sort of uh, cited in uh, a couple of books that I've read on this whole mess. So yeah, basically, the massive garden and palace complex was built during the 18th and early 19th century, and have for a long time functioned as a place for res residence and office for Qing emperors. Known for its splendor, the palace stands as a tribute to the achievements of Chinese culture. The day we received news that British soldiers occupying Beijing bur burnt the palace to the ground. So, um, what is the effect of the Second Opium War, which is concluded mostly after the burning of the Summer Palace, after which the emperor at the time uh, runs away to Zhehol, which uh, I think is somewhere over here, which was like the one of the retreats of the Qing emperors in Manchuria, the hunting retreat, in a way. Uh, and it was still like a massive fucking palace, but it wasn't like nearly as, you know, prestigious and luxurious as this one. There are two sort of uh, implications from this. One is that the empire and the Manchus, the Manchu sort of ethnic ethnic ruling class, loses a bunch of face, which is kind of a weird mix between social capital and prestige, societal prestige, uh, which, you know, uh, sometimes when it comes to the government, that coincides with the term mandate of heaven. And uh, obviously that means that the power of the Han uh, ethnicity increases by a bunch and um, that also though happened because of the Taiping rebellion it's very very complex and the second one is that China for the first time has to really seriously consider uh, that the Western powers are like a thing in world politics before they could just kind of like go nya, 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 I don't hear uh, but now they're forced into it and um, and keep in mind I'm very, very much simplifying the whole mess. It was just a mess. And uh, at this point, you know, the whole Chinese trade thing really, really starts to get going. And it's a major boost for the global economy. Um, another thing that happens is, I believe, like the legalization of opium or something. But I don't, I'm not 100% on that. Uh, I am not 100% on that. Um... And this is called the Convention of Beijing, I believe. Um, and another, another sort of consequence is that the Russians get nom nom and they take over all this stuff. Uh, the maritime regions, as they're called. Uh, and we can choose a trade policy again. We still got the external commerce should be free. So thank you. Give me that money. Give me that dough. Ooh, Louis Pasteur, who was uh, an important person, apparently. Um, no, I'm not that ignorant, but I'm relatively ignorant. And the French and the Italians have entered in an alliance. That is... Oh, okay. So they've taken over everything here. So the Kingdom of Sardinia ha now has the Italian flag, and they're about to basically unify Italy. There's probably going to be uh, Garibaldi's expedition. Yeah, Il Risorgimento. Long live Il Risorgimento, which means that they're now Italy. And they're probably going to take over the two Sicilies. 
very, very soon. In the meantime, we're at 15.8% literacy, which is a fucking lot, man. Really, really a lot. And there we go. Declared war on the kingdom of the two Sicilies. We'd rather want the middle class to be taxed a little bit less, though. And in fact, I wouldn't mind the lower class being taxed less either, because that's gonna cause... Uh, so how the uh, how militancy in this game works is that there's a bunch of different uh, modifiers. But for example, if you take a look at this Avadi artisan, which produces explosives... <laughs> Um, he's not fulfilling his life needs and his everyday needs. He gets less militancy because he's a conservative. Conservative pops or majority conservative pops get less militancy. Uh, and they agree with the ruling party, which is reactionary. So obviously, since they're conservatives, they're relatively similar. But they are a minority culture and their life needs and everyday needs are not fulfilled. Now, what does that mean? Uh, life needs is food water um yeah pretty much that everyday needs would be something a little bit more advanced like sanitation what the fuck is that oh okay it's uh fucking moldavia wallachia two principalities okay so the united principalities and um then there's luxury needs and uh like lower income, middle income, and upper income have different life, uh, everyday, and luxury needs. Obviously, like you know, the capitalists are more uh, are more maintenance heavy than the farmer. And what actually goes into oh, this is important. Uh, what actually goes into sort of you know the militancy, how much it rises, is not how much taxes or how much you're taxing people they don't give a shit if you're taxing them a lot if they're getting their especially life and everyday needs and if they're getting the, their luxury needs i believe they like reduce the militancy rather than just anything else like for example he's sort of getting some luxury needs this artisan producing glass does not no that does not okay so this guy gets his <laughs> How the fuck is that even possible? This Avadi bureaucrat gets all of his luxury needs, but none of his everyday needs. That must be some weird combination of like how the market works. Probably like these luxury needs are... Oh, he, he has no luxury needs. Oh, I guess he's just a Spartan. Okay, interesting. Um, I guess he's just a Spartan. Let's see, is this guy... Yeah, okay, so like for example, for this guy, he would have to buy, so that the officers over here would, oh, look at that, he's a nationalist. Um, he gets 95% of his luxury needs and they're like opium. <laughs> <laughs> opium wine, steamer convoys. Why does he need a steamer convoy? You're an officer in Panipat, which probably isn't even by the sea. Uh, everyday needs. Some goods are not available on the market. Like, yeah, apparently these goods are just very, very hard to come by. Uh, and so you get into the weird situation where he gets his luxury ones. Uh, and as you can see, enough luxury bought reduces his militancy. But I believe he's also going to be angry because... He's a different religion, although, all right, I, we've probably I got, got some weird shit when it comes to religion. Yeah, the religious policy secularized. The religion is not explicitly part of state policy, but the state tips its hat to traditional religious values. Um, there's also state atheism, by the way, if you are big brain. Anyway, this is important. This is gonna kickstart a whole bunch. What the fuck? That's early, don't you think? What the actual... This is some border gore and a half. With the Persians taking... You know, Turkmenistan. And the Russians taking half of Afghanistan. It would have been better if it was the opposite for the border gore. And this is also relatively scary. Because it means at some point in our life we're going to have to fight the Russians most likely. Unless they collapse on their own. Which 
sometimes they do. Um, so basically, yo, we didn't have a war of a Burma, which is something that usually happens. Okay, whatever. Uh, the Sepoy Rebellion. Now, the Sepoys are essentially like these people. Everyone who's not English over here, like Punjabi soldiers, Punjabi soldiers, or I'm probably getting this wrong, but that's how I understand it. Uh, Avadis, Avadis, Nepalis, uh, Kanajis, uh, Bengali, Bengali, Nepalese, Asian Minor. Pff, what the fuck does that even mean, Asian Minor? What, what kind of culture is that? Uh, Nepalis, Nepalis, oh, English soldiers. So, like, the English soldiers aren't Sepoys. Um, a mutiny by a group of Sepoys in the service of the... Uh, so, so, Sepoys are basically just, like, the British Indian version of, like, Ascaris. You know, if you know that. Like, native soldiers in the service of the colonialists. A mutiny by a group of Sepoys in the service of the British East India Company has ignited lingering resentment amongst their Indian subjects into open resistance against our rule. Should this grow out of hand, all of our holdings in British India could be in jeopardy. Oh no, this could mean trouble. So, we get the Sepoy Rebellion event, or the UK gets the Sepoy Rebellion event. The East India Company gets the Sepoy Rebellion until... It says until the 1st of January 1946, which is the last day of the game. Haha, <laughs> get it, it turns into Hearts of Iron. But actually, it only lasts until we put it down. Which just fucks up our everything, because... Our subjects are revolting and, you know, we're relying on them to do everything. And, oh, yo, look at that. A bunch of these are, like, Pashtun, pa Pashtun patriots. Fuck, it's the Afghans. Um, yeah, right, this is the army that I knew was going to be trouble because I recruited it from all the Punjabis. I added a new army, so as you can see, my units are now 80. Uh, but as you can see, they're angry. Um, then, for any province that is an India Corps, so all of them, like if we take a look at the India Corps, I believe it goes all the way up to... No. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. India, India. Like, for example, even Quetta is an Indian Corps. Everything... Like, Indian Corps are there in everything that is eventually going to become the British Raj minus Burma, I believe. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, so basically, everything that is an India Corps means this, roughly. Uh, except Afghanistan, obviously. Uh, what happens? One of three options will happen. 40% of all poor strata gain, 6% militancy, aka most of the people, aka generally the province gets around 4 or 5 militancy. Any province gets nationalist agitation until the 20th of September, so two, for two years they get nationalist agitation which gives, just increases a bunch of shit. That is bad, uh, increases a bunch of bad shit, obviously. 40% chance that all poor strata gain 3%, so that's like the sort of lower option and they still get nationalist agitation, or 20% chance of no effect. And also something else bad will happen. The Emperor's Acclamation. Now, who the fuck is the Emperor? Uh, <laughs> there is this little one province minor over here, called the Mughal Empire. Now, the Mughal Empire, or Mughal Empire, however the fuck you want to call it, is... Um, what is, I believe at this point, still technically claiming to rule, like, all of India, basically. So if we take a look at the diplomatic map mode, you can see that they have cores on most of northern India. Um, they're, they used to be like this, like the Mughal Empire used to be basically this thing. Now, then, partially because it became a shit show, and partially because the British killed it, it became a rump state, a remnant. And it's in Delhi, and, you know, the emperor there still thinks he rules the universe or whatever. In 1857, the Mughal emperor Bahadur Shah heeded calls of the Muslim leaders and declared a jihad against the British Empire. Ah, yes, love it. Uh, expelling the British troops from Delhi. He is being acclaimed as the emperor of India. Although this acclamation is not heard or recognized throughout all of India, the Muslim population quickly rallied to his side. Order the troops to move immediately. So, um... 
So every province that's a Mughal Empire core, but not a Sikh Empire or a Nepal core. So like for example, this province over here is a Sikh Empire core, but also a Mughal Empire core, but it's a Sikh Empire core, so it's not gonna revolt. Everyone else goes to the Mughal Empire. And obviously, apparently, there were some angry people here, and we killed them. So, that's what we're gonna have to face the next time. Uh, the Jihad and uh, angry Indians. And, oh, really now? First core, the first Bombay Kuras here. What the fuck? How did the Bombay Kuras here revolt? That does not make... Ah, oh, whatever, the game sometimes. And, oh shit, basically the entire army I had over here revolted. Anyway, next time, we're gonna be putting down this... You know, this uprising in the name of the glorious empire. And, uh, yeah. So I hope you had a fun today, and uh, see you soon. 16% literacy. We have big brain.